My name is Jeff Althaus. As was already said, I am an expert on <laughs> ecological economics. Ask me anything, I know it all. <laughs> um, I'm from the United States, from a small town in Pennsylvania, and EPOG was a great opportunity for me to learn about different ways of doing economics. I remember when I was in my undergraduate coursework in economics, and I thought, well, this is strange. This doesn't seem to match with my real world experience, and yet this is what economics seems to be, is that we're all a bunch of profit maximizing, rational people that though we're all out for our own good, we're creating a society of infinite wealth and prosperity. That doesn't seem to be the case in my point of view and the problems that I saw while I was in college and when I've traveled around didn't seem to match that. So coming to EPOG was really eye-opening for me because I got to see that economics could be done in a different way and include new things like inequality and potentially even the environment. And I think this is a great starting point, but I believe that we're missing a lot of the bigger picture, that maybe economics doesn't always have the answers to, because not all of the problems that we're facing are really economic problems. So what I, what I want to do today is kind of talk about what some of those problems are, what economics says about them, and what we can, can and can't say um, about some of the problems that we're facing right now. Um, one of them that I think is really important that I wanted you guys to read about, I don't know if anyone read any of the articles that I, that I had sent over about degrowth, one of them is about the, uh, the current ecological crisis. And it seems to me that the world is on fire, that we're baking the planet, that we're destroying and undermining all of the, all of nature's capacity to produce and reproduce life. And we're not really doing anything about it. And in fact, we have an incredibly wealthy society with the power to send people to the moon and potentially to Mars soon enough. And yet, we seem to not really care that much about the way we're taking care of our home and even the things, the qualitative things that make life worth living here in terms of our interaction with each other and cooperation and caring at home. And a lot of these things are totally left out of economic models. And so right now I, uh, at Paris 13, I'm doing my research on, on water scarcity. And I don't do this because I have been really interested in water issues my whole life. And I don't do it because I'm a great modeler because I certainly am not. <laughs> and I didn't, I didn't choose the most complex thing possible to model uh, because I really wanted to do that. I, I did it because I can't think of a single time in an economics classroom when I learned about water and its necessity to life itself and all economic processes when it is the actual essence of life. And this seems to me to be a fundamental oversight in the whole entirety of the field that we're all studying. So I think that I want to invite you guys to, and I'm, I'm not going to rant all day, <laughs> um, I want to invite you guys to participate with me in, in creating a discussion about what economics can and can't do and what maybe economics should do, and what we should be trying to preserve on this, on this earth and, and with our time here. Because otherwise, we're answering someone else's questions. Right? 
cool. <laughs> Sometimes I feel like I'm just the long-haired hippie in the back screaming to everyone, guys, let's stop this. What are we doing? And everyone says, oh, get, get, get a job. Or what else have you got that's better than what we're doing? And I think that's false. I think that we all know what's really important. And I think that when I look around and I talk to people, most people really want to live in a society that treats everyone well, that respects the environment. And those fundamental values seem to be missing from the community that we live in. And we seem to feel powerless to do anything about it. What are these structures that make us feel like we can do nothing? And why do we support them? Because we are creating them always. The individual is the society. And in our interactions, and in our beliefs, and in our, our action with the world around us, we're creating this world that we're seeing. And we can't just say, oh, well, that's just, that's just this happening over there, and I'm just living my life. Because, because that's not how it is. We're living our life and we're participating in the society that is going off a cliff right now. And the only solutions I seem to see from an economic standpoint are invest more, grow more, consume more, but greenly, whatever that means. And we'll talk about that later. So it seems to be empty promises. This was just, I think we should stop running around. <laughs> I think we are serving someone else's goals right now. And I think that economics can be a study that incorporates a lot more than what we're, than what we're currently incorporating. So I wanted to talk about scarcity and abundance a little bit. And then what true abundance is. I was looking through uh, the post-Keynesian economics textbook, thanks Mark, <laughs> and Mark was saying how the neoclassical viewpoint depends on scarcity. Scarcity is the fundamental problem in a neoclassical framework. There's not enough to go around. And in order to solve the problem of scarcity, all of us individual actors that are rationally optimizing and forward looking through our individual, through our decision making, we are motivated to go about and do what we need to do through the pricing system and create wealth and abundance uh, through, those, through those, the pricing indicator. The policy pres prescription for this then is, well, we should privilege individual power um, and reduce any market, inf uh, market interference in the, uh, by, by the state. So what's the normative subtext of this? The goal of neoclassical economics then is that people can work a lot and they should work and that work allows more people to achieve maximum utility to have more stuff more quickly. This is, this is what the goal is. It seems to me. And then if we're going to look at heterodox economics or post-Keynesian economics, we can say that there is abundant means of production, and the problem is that we have scarcity of utilization of, the, of that abundant means of production. So we're not using enough of it. So we can introduce effective demand policies to overcome any idleness of, of these resources and reproduce abundance. And we can use redistributive, redistributive policies to safeguard equality, which will allow us to overcome any slack and, again, reduce idleness. 
so the policy prescription is we can privilege the state to limit social crises and ecological crises, but with the purpose of producing more growth. So then growth and equality and work are co-created, co-dependent, so that we can get more people, more stuff, more quickly. So we have this sort of triangle of abundance where we constantly need more and more productivity and efficiency. Sorry, that equality should be at the, at the corner there. We need more and more employment and we need equality because that gets us more employment and productivity and efficiency and growth. And this seems to me to be what in, what's encapsulating life right now. And I don't think that's really what we want. And I think that, one, idle resources is not such a bad thing. That maybe sometimes things should be laid to rest. That we don't want to be even working all the time or have certain resources constantly in use, including ourselves. So then what's the value of employment in this context? So I wanted to talk a, a bit about identity and beliefs. And this is, I've, I've kind of just thrown a bunch of ideas up here. And we can talk about them more in the discussion, in the discussion time. So if our, our beliefs shape our perception of what we see, and our behavior in the world around us. So if we believe that all people are greedy, then we're not going to trust anyone. But if we believe that everyone's out to look, look care for us, then maybe I can leave my computer out when I am at the library and I want to go to the bathroom. I can just leave it out and people aren't going to steal it. But if I believe that people are greedy, I'm going to take this, I'm going to take this with me. And then I'm, I'm living with the weight of who's around me? <laughs> who's going to get something from me all the time? Um, if we believe there's not enough of, of, of things, we're always going to have to produce more. If I believe that my country is the greatest, if we have to make America great again, then we will step over other, other countries and do whatever we want because we're serving the purpose of creating this great nation together. And I think the same thing is true with the economy. I think that if we believe that the economy is this concept that we have to serve, that it must keep growing and be strong and vibrant and big and efficient, then our whole lives will be based on serving this concept rather than living the life that we have here and appreciating everything that's happening right now. So if the economy has to be growing, what, what are the tools for, for, for keeping this in play? Well, we, the state can, can create and, and private enterprise will create knowledge production and and psychosocial discipline through knowledge creation. So like, we'll create ideas of scarcity, we'll create ideas of progress, of development. Uh, if, if it's the state, we'll have ideas like in America of manifest destiny that we have, that was the idea that Americans should go across, the, across from the East Coast to the West Coast and discover the new lands and the frontier and start to settle because that's, that's what we're here for, to settle the land. Uh, if it's religion, it could be, it could be heaven. Um, anything that distracts us from really what's here. You can also, this, you, you know, we, we're disciplined through time. If, we, if we're not, if we're working all the time, We have less leisure 
to enjoy what's around us and see what's actually important. Uh, bread and circuses, sort of the old Roman idea that we can just give the people, you know, uh, gladiator battles and some bread and, they, and they, won't, they won't revolt against us, right? And then state violence, obviously, that if you, if, if you don't work, you're not paying your taxes, and if you're not paying your taxes, well, you're in trouble. So I wonder to what degree economics plays in creating certain ideological concepts that reinforce some of these processes that don't allow us to see through the fact that we are constantly a, a part of the society creating it and that we feel obligated to be a part of this, this kind of growing machine. And, we, and a lot of people don't want to, I don't, I don't think. That's, that's the impression that I get. So what are the, some of these normative values in economics? The fundamental values are about reproducing production itself. We're maximizing well-being through maximizing consumption. Um, we want to work, whether that's labor, we prioritize work, whether that's labor or machine work, and output, so producing and consuming. Um, equality, education, sustainability, leisure, care, cooperation are means of supporting work and production rather than ends in themselves. And it seems to me that we have this backwards. So the economy, in this, in this sense, has to be served at all costs. And life is serving work rather than serving continual life itself. I came across this article on the Maldives um, recently in The Guardian. And it really struck me as, as being poignant to this, to this concept here. And the Maldives are, if you guys don't know, are a bunch of islands in the, off the coast of India, I believe. And 75% the of, the, of all of the islands are projected to be underwater by 2100. And there was some rumblings that the, the old, one of the political leaders beforehand was, was saying that we need, we need to get new islands or we need to tr locate a vast majority of our people to somewhere else because we're all just going to drown, basically. So what happened was some new leaders came in and they said, well, no, what actually needs to happen is we need to develop um, a new capital city. We need high-end resorts. We need high-tech centers. We need economic free zones, free universities to attract a global elite. The whole Society is going to die in the Maldives, or the 75% of it, and the ship is sinking, and, and the only solution seems to be, let's do more of exactly what we've been doing before. So that's one of the officials is quoted as saying, it's not going to happen next year that the Maldives will be underwater. We have immediate needs. Development must go on, jobs are needed, the Maldives need money to survive, and tourism will be the savior of the Maldives. I don't think that tourism will be the savior of the Maldives. I really don't, and I, I don't think that anyone else does either. <laughs> I saw this and it made me want to pull my hair out. <laughs> This is a, a boy named Nathaniel who, at five years old, was asked in his kindergarten class to write about his hopes and dreams. My favorite thing about kindergarten, my hopes and dreams, is working because I was born to work. And there is Nathaniel. Where is he? Nathaniel is in a boardroom sitting at a table, he's, he's the next Donald Trump. What is outside 
some trees. Some trees that he gets to look at from his, from his nice boardroom, because he was born to work. These are the five-year-olds that we're creating in our society. I, I, I remember reading an article recently about, uh, about these, these education consultants in New York that were charging four or five hundred dollars an hour to the parents so that their, their four-year-olds could get accepted to elite boarding schools or, or elite, elite private schools in, in New York City. And, and I was like, what is going through the parents' minds that they need to force their kid to the, the education consultant is for the child, not for the, not for the parents. The kid needs to go to learn how to be a, the ideal working kid that's going to be successful in the boardroom of life by four years old. We're, we're destroying everything that it means to be a joyous child just to keep doing what we're doing, guys. There was, a, uh, there was a book written in 1948 by a German philosopher, I think named Joseph Piper, and it was called Leisure, the Basis of Culture, and he, he talks about this concept called total work. And total work, he said, is, is this idea that, that everything starts to revolve around work and all of our, con our, con our concept of time starts to become more work-related. So we start to subordinate and do everything in service to work itself. So nature, why is nature important? Well, nature is important because it makes us, uh, because it, if we go into nature, we're a little bit more relaxed and then we can come back and go to work. Why is nature important? Well, because if we have a few trees, then uh, my property value is increased, and that means that I, I'm a wealthier person, or I can sell the house with a few more trees on it and get a better house. Leisure time. Uh, why do we go on vacation? We go on vacation so we can spend two weeks worried about our vacation mostly. If you've ever vacationed with my family, my, my parents are mostly just worried about whether or not everyone's having fun the entire time and not actually enjoying the vacation itself. But we go on vacation for two weeks so that we can come back and be a little bit more productive and not, not go crazy at the fact that we're in a bunch of dead-end jobs or, or seemingly meaningless jobs and we sit at a desk all day in front of a glowing screen I don't think that when, if you were a kid, except for Nathan, <laughs> that if you dreamed the most fun time for yourself as an adult, that you would say that you wanted to spend your day sitting at a computer screen. And I think that's, that's what most of us are doing right now. I think that if you were a kid, and I challenge you guys to go to a park and look at kids. We'll just watch them from afar because it's, things are t th it's weird for, for adults to look at kids too long. <laughs> but I want you to look at the energy that they have and the vitality for life that they have. They have an infinite capacity to cooperate they have an infin infinite capacity to not cooperate as well, but they have a great capacity to cooperate, to work together, to solve problems, to care for each other, to care for you. And, and when, I, when I'm on the subway, I look around and everyone's faces are like this. And I think that we were, I think the, that we're losing something in, in life itself, if we are constantly dedicated to, to serving the purposes of being useful and productive and efficient. 
I was, uh, I was reading an article, too, about, about Soylent. Does anyone know about so what Soylent is? Show of hands. Do you, you want to say what Soylent is? Yeah. Exactly. So what's what is what is the point of food, guys? What's the point of food? There's there's no real point of food except that it's it tastes great. You get to share with everyone around you, and and it's it's nice to it's nice to raise animals. It's nice to 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 go up into a tree and pick a banana. <laughs> I don't know, but eating for the, the inventor of Soylent was such a distraction from his work. He was a programmer, and he, he was like, how am I going to make up a million dollar idea? How am I going to make up a million dollar idea? And he spent so, mon so much time trying to do this that he had to create Soylent so that he could survive because he was wasting too much time, he said, eating. I was wasting my time eating. That's why he created Soylent, and I and I saw this. There's, there's a new. I, I saw this uh, article as well. There's a new pill that they're gonna, that they're trying to make. There's a race to create a new pill, so that no one has to exercise. So no one will have to move ever again because we're gonna Amazon all of our goods to our house. We're gonna sit in our chair. We're gonna watch Netflix, and we're gonna take a pill so that we don't have to exercise. That's. That's what we're going towards, guys. We don't need this to be the foundation of our society. So I had I'd sent as some of the articles. Um, one of them was a book by a guy named E. F. Schumacher, who was an economist around the times of the time of Keynes. Actually, he wrote a book called "Small Is Beautiful," and he wrote this book when he went to Burma, actually, as, a as an economics consultant, and he saw all these Buddhists around, and he was like, oh, what are you guys, what are you guys doing? And he was really interested in, in, the, in the whole philosophy, so he spent a lot of his time in Burma meditating and rethinking some of his original presuppositions about economics and what's, what kinds of questions we're able to answer and what kinds of questions we're not able to answer. And I think this was a really poignant book. And I, I invite you guys, if you haven't looked at it, to, to read some of the, the first, some of the first few chapters in it, um, because it's really interesting. There's a chapter literally called Buddhist Economics, it's, which is cool. And one of the questions he asks is, what does it mean for something to be uneconomic? What, I asked that question to you guys. What does it mean for something to be uneconomic? Not an efficient use of means. Anyone else? Was, there's no wrong answer. I was just non-maximizing. Uh, non it gives a, a poor profit rate. I would say that if this is our only lens through which we're perceiving the world, then we're missing a whole lot of what's important. And this is n not even counting the fact that in most economic analyses, nature is totally unaccounted for. Um, economic questions posed to economists can only give economic answers. And so, the answer we're, we're going to get back is exactly the kinds of things that we just, just talked about. So Keynes wrote, did you, have you guys ever read the, the Keynes essay uh, what, on the, the possibilities for our grandchildren? And he says that only when we're rich can we value the ends above means and the good above useful. But that time is not now, he said, in 1930. We have to keep on growing. We have to keep on working. And he said that for our grandchildren, we'd finally be at, that, at the time when we can sit down, 
relax, and enjoy ourselves. That time has passed. And, and we haven't sat down yet. I invite us all to sit down for a little bit. <laughs> um, if value, I think value can only come from commodification because economics can only study things that have a price to them. Uh, then our life becomes reduced to a series of opportunity costs where we're constantly looking for short-term advantage taking and shifting responsibility to someone else or to the system itself as if we're not co-creating it. And so I wanted to look at what true abundance was and so I tried to be as hippie as possible in my in my understanding of what true abundance was. I grew my hair even longer <laughs> to, to do that. And I think that real abundance is a, is a state of mind and it's a way of interbeing with everything around us. And that when things like love and health and freedom are the source of all of our actions, then the world we see out there is significantly nicer and begins to reflect what's in here. And I think that economics can focus a lot more on some of these qualitative aspects that clearly are far more important than the amount of stuff that we have. And I don't think we have to worry so much about work and efficiency because when you're with a group of friends and you need to get something done, you get it done and it's not painful and it's not really even work. It's just an expression between you guys. Um, how much time do I have left? Uh, ten minutes. Ten minutes? Uh, I'll, try and be, I'll try and be quick with this. I've actually wanted to look a little bit at my master's, my master's thesis um, that was sort of on a, on a similar vein that got me kind of intrigued by, by a lot of these questions too. Uh, we'll talk more about degrowth when, when these guys start talking. Excuse me. Uh, one of the questions that I want to pose to you guys is, well, do we think that growth is going to be the way we get out of this problem that we see ourselves in? And I don't think so. I think that what we're seeing is a massive overshoot of a lot of the planetary boundaries. And I would include psychological boundaries on that same, that same plane, though it's not, it's not listed here. So when we, when we talk about the climate crisis, some of the problems we see from an economic standpoint are that, are that resource limits will reduce the productivity of capital and labor or investments, the uncertainty will reduce animal spirits, so it'll do reduce investment, uh, higher capital depreciation that we might see from climate change uh, can increase our costs, and it can create cycles of inequality and poverty. So our solution to this in economics, and this is from a heterodox standpoint, is that we can invest more reduce our work with with a caveat there and then and then consume more greenly and I'll go into some problems with with these right now that I don't think that these are really what's going to solve the issues at hand so green investment if climate change is going to reduce investment 
uh, because of reduced animal spirits or that uh, capital is going to, or that people are going to feel less, uh, less willing to invest, I is going to go down on the one side. Right? So if I goes down, that means either savings has to decrease, which means a higher consumption, or uh, government has to step in and invest itself. So we, to, in order to, main, to maintain employment. So we have to keep, keep, the, keep that balance of, of employment in post-Keynesian economics. So we can direct private credit to green investments and through green loans. The government can invest in green technology, or we can increase spending on low-impact services. This is, I don't know what low-impact services are out there. We can invest in education, or we can invest in arts, or we can invest in uh, uh, one of the articles that I, one of the articles that I, that we read actually for, for this, that I read for, for this paper was, was saying that what we can do is we can invest in advertising and marketing that in order to reduce our economic, our footprint on the planet, we can increase consumption greenly by increasing the amount of convincing to buy stuff. <laughs> this, was, this was one of the, the propositions by a post-Keynesian economist, and I thought that, that was kind of doublespeak here. Uh, I don't think that investment is going to save us from, the, from this climate crisis. Uh, green investment in itself is investment. If we're investing, we're essentially growing the economy. Any amount of mitigation effort, so if we look at mu as uh, some portion of, of Y of, of income that's dedicated toward, towards mitigation, we're essentially, we're growing the economy still. We have to use resources to, to build anything. So at best, we have a relative decoupling from energy use or resource use. So what we've seen is that as we're trying to, as, as we're trying to solve the climate crisis, we propose these solutions that, are, that say, oh, we can just be more efficient, we can be more efficient, we can be more efficient. But being more efficient requires more stuff, more energy more investment. We're growing the pie, we're creating more employment. This is, this is great if employment is the thing that you want, but if reducing work and creating a society where, where we're fundamentally here and, and, and not dependent on some, some boss, then, then this is not what we, what we need to be striving for. Uh, this is just about the, the productivity trap. Uh, there's a, there's a well-known identity called the Kaya identity, which basically just says that there's an inseparable link between labor productivity and energy use. So as we increase labor productivity, which is generally what we deem efficient, um, we're almost by necessity, by definition of this identity, increasing the intensity of energy use in our economy. And what we tend to do is keep growing the economy, which while we may be more efficient, as the economy is growing with each dollar of GDP is, is, is using less materials or less energy, we keep growing the GDP so high that we're, out, we're continually outstripping the planet's capacity to serve us. Um, and the, the obstacle that we face is huge. In order for us to reach the 450 parts per million carbon target that we set for 2050, requires a massive, massive reduction in, in energy use. And we'd have to reduce our carbon intensity by 21 fold in the next two or three decades to reach this. Now, the fastest reduction in carbon intensity in the history of, of recorded carbon intensities <laughs> that we know of is, was Russia in the 1990s, which was a third of this, 
and happened only after massive industrial collapse and a huge importation of carbon intensive activity, carbon intensive goods from elsewhere. So this is, this is we're, I mean, it's, it's very clear that we're going to pass the limits that we've set for ourselves to me. And so the question is, can we continue on the, in the same, on the same path? I, one of the, one of the pr propositions is, is uh, for, for reducing our impact on the environment is also reducing working time. One of the problems with reducing working time is that it can t actually tighten the labor market because it increases the, b the bargaining power of workers. So capitalists um, will naturally search to replace workers that are offering, that are, that are demanding a higher wages so they can then invest in more machines which require more energy. So this, we're, we're just creating this cycle of increasing productivity. Then workers go back to being more, the, to raising unemployment um, and hiring higher energy use. So we'd have to consistently reduce working time as pro productivity rises to maintain employment and reduce, uh, reduce our energy emissions. So in total, we have to reduce aggregate work. The question, though, if we're reducing working time, is what are people going to do with their free time? And I think if we look at the, the work of uh, the, that, the article I was talking about on total work, that people feel like they don't know what to do with their free time. That people tend to feel like they, with their free time, well, they just need to, I don't know, maybe I need to buy more stuff. Maybe I need to go to the mall with my free time. Or maybe I need to just sit and watch Netflix. I don't think that that's the, I don't think that's the, the what free time is for. I think we need investment in convivial activities. I think we need community building in a radical way in order to appreciate the free time that's there. Or else we're all going to end up like Nathan. <laughs> um, and I sort of talked about dematerializing consumption. Uh, I don't believe in green consumption. I don't think that's going to that's gonna bring us anywhere near uh, where, where we need to be. And, and, and I think it, I find it really fascinating that if we feel like, well, okay, we're, we, we don't want more investment because if, if we're investing, then, then we're increasing energy use and we're increasing materials use. So we want less investment. So in order to maintain employment, we have to increase consumption. But if we increase consumption, we're increasing materials use. We're increasing resource use and we're buying a bunch of stuff that we don't want and we don't need. So there's got to be another way. Um, so I just wanted to throw a few ideas out there for you guys. I think I worry sometimes that economics sometimes helps to legitimize some of the normative values that aren't really serving us. Uh, like we should reduce climate change because it's beneficial to GDP or that we should have basic income or a job guarantee because it boosts aggregate growth or that development we still see as you know the, the global south catching up to the global north and I think that we're missing a lot of a lot of really important things here just comparing wealth creation and efficiency and speed and work and development and progress with things that we really actually want which is equality, beauty, care, conviviality, community, cooperation. And that you can't tell me that if you lived in society or if you lived and really felt in your hearts that, there, that you were fundamentally loved and cared for and nurtured and free, that you really needed to be a consumer. That consuming was going to be your fundamental activity that day. Um, 
I think that's it. Why don't you guys, why don't you guys talk and we'll have a conversation afterwards. Uh, thank you, Jeff, again for your insightful presentation. What we will present something slightly not different, but we will focus more on the growth and the, um, the, the papers we have to read are especially focused on the growth and how to make the growth socially sustainable. That's the outline of our presentation. We will provide first a brief um, definition of the growth, an historical background, how the debate evolved. And then we will move a bit to the research agenda and to possible policies that can be promoted. Um, and then raising some criticism uh, and discussion points. So uh, first, to provide a non, uh, to provide a very simple definition of the growth, making use of the widely accepted definition of Schneider that is cited in the degrowth circles. Uh, degrowth carries the idea of a voluntary reduction of the size of the economic system and then secunda fase of the GDP. Uh, then the main implication is that degrowth uh, constitutes a radical shift from the society of growth towards its opposite, the contraction and the downshifting of the economy. The term degrowth uh, uh, was uh, entered the the academic debate and the, the debate in general with the with Andre Gortz that coined the term decroissance. It was aimed the uh, Andre Gortz um, <coughs> aimed to question the cont compatibility of the capitalist system with the the, the growth of material production, and in doing so, um, is uh, this idea was the, constituted the encounter of the ecologist and the culturalist critique of economics. So, on one end, uh, Georgescu Rogan, the idea of Georgescu Rogan of bioeconomics, bio and on the other, the post-development theories that were developed in the 70s and then by Latouche uh, uh, later. Uh, the, the, the idea of the growth spread in particular with the 21st century, with uh, colloquia such as the Colloquia d'UNESCO or the conference, the Colloquium in L Lyon in 2003, and uh, then, but that spread to the academia, but also to the political debate, uh, thanks to the, uh, thanks to social movements and in particular environmental movements. And it entered even the mainstream. It was uh, the degrowth, or better, anti degrowth, was uh, quoted by Krugman in an article uh, on, in the New York Times and by Pope Francis in his second uh, encyclical, Laudato Si. Uh, some, uh, p moving to, some, to define some principles of degrowth. Um, we can, uh, we should say that uh, degrowth doesn't simply encompass the, 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 the reduction of economic activity, but uh, express concerns more broadly on democracy, justice, meaning of life and well-being. And so it constitutes, in the words of Latouche, a uh, more uh, broader um, rupture with the growth society. Um, so it's not merely GDP reduction, but the objective is also to promote justice and sustainability. And in doing so, uh, the growth can be conceived as a concrete utopia. And I, I mean, it seems to me that the idea of concrete utopia is a bit of tautology, a <laughs> contradictio in terminis. So I want to know what, what you think. Um, then, th again, the idea of um, the, va the valid idea that uh, in the, the capitalist society has some socio ecological economic limits um, is a. Uh, um, like specifying more this idea, um, the Asara and De Maria and Otero um, justified debt dynamics in a, in a capitalist society with the obsession to promote growth. And also this seem, seems a bit in contradiction with the post uh, uh literature, in particular with Miski, because it, it would, would have been, the, the causality should, should be the opposite, uh, in, my, in my view. And also another uh, view that is a bit controversial in the paper was the, the, the idea that austerity policies are undertaken to restore stability and then, in, in, and then growth. And this is simpl simply proven false by, uh, by recent history. Uh, but in general, the idea of socio-ecological uh, economic crisis uh, stems from, the, from a contradiction of the capitalist mode of production, that it's the, 
the, the fact that capitalism uh, uh, undermines the biophysical conditions on which it depends in the pursuit of capital accumulation. Then, uh, w moving to the focus of the degrowth research agenda, we summarized in uh, four points. Uh, first, there is the, the main problem is how to promote the selective downscaling of man-made capital and how to make uh, degrowth socially sustainable, uh, orienting, like, more very broadly speaking, uh, how to oops, how to promote good life for individuals in a society. And what's a, also a very interesting um, research field is the income and well-being, well and what, what, was no, what is known in the literature with the, as Easterlin paradox, uh, that uh, argues in favor of a lack of positive correlation between uh, uh, subjective well-being and income growth. And uh, an alternative way to put it is the, the threshold, threshold hypothesis that after a certain point, economic growth doesn't bring any improvement in people's quality of life. And uh, so, and uh, another point that it's um, it's growing in importance, uh, especially after the the research started by Piketty and Immanuel Seitz, et etc., is the the link between inequality and ecology. And the main question, the main research question in this sense, is how to make the growth stable while reducing inequality. And then I give floor to Maria Christine. So I'm going to talk a bit about uh, the six core principles of the framework. So what is the commonalities within the degrowth uh, framework? So first one is uh, the economy is an invention. So the critic is like, there is no such thing as a universal knowledge uh, that is economic. So economics is a more broad, should be a more broad uh, thing. Uh, the second is that the economic is uh, political. So there is a choice and uh, we he should be choosing for something that uh, uh, is more sensual in this uh, sense. The economy is material. Uh, it's also diverse, which is linked to the first uh, point. And uh, the central economic question is a surplus, not uh, scarcity, as uh, Jeff commented uh, uh, extensively in the presentation, so I'm just gonna... Uh, and the sixth, uh, which is uh, one that I prefer to focus on, is that the economic change uh, is a co-evolutionary process, and that means that uh, although in the short term, everything is interlocked, in the long term, change is possible. And uh, this is a point that is important because it's how this shift actually is going to happen to a degrowth strategy. And this is important when we discuss politics and how this strategy is going to be adopted and so on and so forth. Uh, on part two of the text, uh, Kali's uh, focus on uh, an alternative account to the crisis and there he comments that uh, uh, linked to these uh, principles of the, the framework, there's much more than uh, what we think it is uh, our economy. So it's not just the normal capitalist activities, uh, it's uh, these so-called non-capitalist economies where you have these communities and these uh, other kinds of services that not, that's not what we consider uh, profitable and so on, and this would also be very important on how to recover from crisis. And in this point, I think it's important for us to discuss examples of this and where these uh, uh, not so mainstream strategies are located, because most often these uh, new ideas of new e economies and new uh, non-capitalist economies are mostly based on the developed world, so this is something also that we have to bear in mind. Uh, the third point is um, the, this alternative economy as uh, embodiment of these uh, new economies and this is linked then to this, uh, in the Polonian sense, it's something that goes against the commodification of everything. Because this is exactly like how we fight uh, the com commodification of society, of uh, labor, of nature, of money and so on and so forth. So what they are arguing is for this new strategy of these non-capitalist economies. On the fourth part, uh, more pragmatic, uh, they, he exposes the new kind of politics, new kind of policies that can be adopted. First one that Jeff also mentioned, 
uh, is work sharing and a reduction of working hours, like with eco communities, uh, cooperatives, and so on and so forth. Second is uh, unconditional basic income, which I think is a point for discussion as well. Uh, because uh, I think this is uh, one strategy to fight the fact that uh, to reduce inequalities, the level of income of some people or to reduce the working hours, they would reach the point that they cannot uh, even uh, have a subsistence level or something like this. But this is, I think, it's also debatable, so we can leave for discussion later. The third one is taxation on resources and carbon. And this also on the critics of Branko Milanovic that I'm going to expose uh, further on. He agrees with that, so it's one, uh, um, one point that is not so debatable in both, in, in both in the critics and in the literature of the growth. Fourth is the new economic investment program that is more related to these communities and these non-capitalist economies because uh, in the literature of the growth, as it has been exposed before, uh, green economy or green growth per se is a nonsense because we would be growing so doing investment to, to grow even more the economy would be a nonsense the fifth uh, policy is also a bit uh, polemic and very let's say radical to a certain extent because it's the idea of public money so it's the public control over money creation and so on some um, some people also argue in the sense of the positive uh, money theory, which is a group that has been, uh, we can also discuss further on that. And then uh, the idea of creating, because also the point that has been highlighted here for the degrowth theorists is that debt is also boosting this, uh, uh, this path that we are creating in our society. So we should stop this mechanism in order to stop growth and so on and so forth. So one of the strategies is um, stopping the existence of uh, this uh, spiral, that spiral that exists in our society and uh, give back the power to politics. One uh, strategy as well is the implementation of these time banks and this uh, he mentions in the text but I related uh, with uh, labor certificates in the Marxist theory that you get a certificate by the amount of time that you work for instance in this probably in this non-capitalist uh, economies and uh, I would like to know how exactly does that work and because I don't see this happening in a ca within a capitalist society because these labor certificates are not there to be exchanged by any mean of consumption in the Marxist idea, n nor in the degrowth strategy, I don't see that happening either because then this would be boost boosting consumption and so on. Some points raised by Branko Milanovic regarding um, the degrowth strategy, uh, Branko uh, studies focus a lot on the income inequality and is one of the uh, organizers and creators of the um, LIS database. And uh, he's arguing that uh, we have four possible scenarios. One would be not changing uh, income distribution and stopping growth exactly where we are nowadays. And this would mean that we would leave a huge amount of the world population immiserated. The second scenario would be increasing income of the poor while decreasing income of the rich. So if we uh, base this on the average income of the Western countries, this would mean that we still have to multiply the world's GDP 2.7 times. The third scenario is uh, doing this with the mean uh, income in a global level, and this would mean a reduction in the Western society of two-thirds of the economy. So this would be like, uh, I don't know, closing factories, closing airports, uh, removing trains and airports, and so on and so forth. And the fourth scenario is considering the growth in population and the reduction of uh, the carbon footprint by the reduction of consumption of goods that, are, uh, that produce a lot of, uh, emit a lot of carbon. And this would be back to the third scenario. So the growth in population would offset the, the gain with uh, carbon. Rebating uh, Milanovic, uh, Jason Hickel that writes for The Guardian and is an anthropologist of the London School of Economics. 
says that uh, we should not focus just on income. Uh, remembering how people used to live in the 70s, the quality of life and so on was much better than what we have nowadays and we didn't have this consumerism and so on. There's also the, the example of uh, Costa Rica that he gives, that people in Costa Rica seem to have uh, uh, a better quality of life and levels of happiness rather than uh, in the Western world and Western societies and uh, developed world. But this is also questionable because uh, can we actually reproduce the, co the conditions that are there in Costa, Costa Rica elsewhere? Because it's concerning nature, cultural, and so on. So can you reproduce actually the scenario of Costa Rica in, let's say, Germany or Sweden? I don't know. Um, one other thing is that um, that is highly criticized also by Branko Milanovic because they had uh, two posts debating on it and they exchanged mails and uh, the answer of Branko Milanovic is like, yes, fine, I agree with everything you're saying, it seems so beautiful and nice, but how do you implement this and also within a capitalist society, within democracy? So it's uh, almost absurdity and how can you actually implement it? This, even the policies that are mentioned on, on the paper of Kali's are actually. So here we uh, wrap it up some uh, critics that can be found uh, in this text by Foster. Uh, when facing stagnation and depression, degrowth theorists might come to arg or come to the point to arg for green growth or green new deal strategies. This has been the case already. Second point is that uh, uh, the doctrines of steady state, so stopping growth where we are or reaching a point of steady state, can be even considered amoral for some countries that are underdeveloped or in development process. Third point uh, is that uh, the deep growth theorists don't actually make a, dis a class distinction, especially concerning ecological crisis. So the countries that are underdeveloped are also the ones that are going to suffer the most uh, when we come to the verge of uh, uh, facing an ecological crisis. And uh, last but not least, these democratic solutions do not seem so feasible. And uh, a non-democratic alternative within the capitalist system seems also not desirable, not a stable path. Yes, and on the basis of these critiques, uh, we elaborated the, um, what we called the impossible tri trilemma of the growth. <laughs> and so, um, as we, we argue that, uh, that it's impossible to combine together capitalism, democracy, and sustainability uh, in, in its broadest sense as econo economic, ecological, and social sustainability. And so, w um, uh, also our provocation, let's say, is to try to, well, we would like to, to, to discuss with you, but I, I've, our idea is that the, the growth theorists are o uh, often ambiguous on what will be the, 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 the mode of production, the economic system uh, in which we should implement the growth policies, if it's under capitalism or not, or if we should call this socialism or how sh should it be called. And, uh, and also uh, because uh, we, um, well, sustainability, uh, it's possible to reach sustainability under capitalism, but as Branko Milanovic argued, but also as arg widely argued, I remember uh, during the, sum the FMM summer school this year that Antonella Stirati has um, argued in response to, uh, to, 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 to the crit to, um, to, to the critiques of, to, to a criticism of growth, argue that it's, yes, it's possible to, to degrow under capitalism, but we should impose uh, a system that is centrally planned and we should uh, renounce to democracy. And I don't know if this is really a sustainable and stable system. So uh, what, will, what, will the future, what the future will look like? Should we uh, promote the post-capitalist transition, or it's just, uh, uh, well, where are we going with degrowth, basically? And, okay, further points of discussion? Yeah, so we want to 
recap some points of that are maybe important for discussion. First one is uh, the example of Costa Rica and other examples in the sense. So is it uh, really true that uh, these uh, societies in the in underdeveloped world are actually having a happiness level that is better th than in the developed world? And uh, do the people in the developed world actually want to shift to this kind of society where people actually don't have the uh, enough income for some kind of uh, things that uh, people have in the developed world? And can we reproduce this uh, scenario place else? The second point is the Jevons paradox that uh, Jeff also mentioned in his presentation. So green growth is actually not really an alternative for us. Uh, if we believe, does it really exist uh, a steady state? Or was, so where is the point where we should stop growing? And does this point actually exist? Uh, the fourth point is public money. So how can this actually be implemented? Because we see this as the most radical uh, political shift that is out there and the one that seems also not so converging with the heterodox schools of thought. Uh, last but not least, uh, uh, we want to make a remark. So what are we preaching for? Is it the growth or the accumulation? So make clear uh, what kind of transformation do we actually want. And this brings us back to the sixth point uh, of the commonalities within the degrowth strategies, which is the, econom the economy as a uh, co-evolutionary thing. So where exactly is the point where we shift? Where is the revolution and where, where is this point? That's our list of references. Thank you. Thanks for the attention and thanks, Jeff. <laughs> okay, so we take, you can take five, ten minutes for an answer to our points and then we open the floor to, to discussion. Okay. Um, I think I still have this guy. Uh, man, guys, great. Uh, I loved your little tri your triangle up there. Great, great summary of the of, of the articles. Um, I cannot answer b many of your questions, mostly because I am not a fortune teller, so that that makes this way more difficult. But um, I'm very interested in. You mentioned universal basic income. I, I'm really interested in that idea. I think anything that relieves people from the need to work is a step towards freedom. Uh, anything that relieves people from the need to depend on uh, some outside employer gives people the freedom to do what they want and to choose a job that maybe fits better for them if they want to. I think that's, a, that's beneficial to everyone. Um, I think that is how people like to interact, right? You don't like to be forced to interact with people that you don't want to talk to. You don't like to be forced to do things that you don't like to do. And when you feel committed to a project that is important to you, you put in all of your effort and work just seems to flow from you, right? And so I think when we have a society that's based more on those kinds of principles, then we're living in coordination with the world rather than against it. So I think universal basic income is great. I, w I wonder what it would be like in, in today's society. I I've, I've worry that somehow it starts getting conditionalities added to it and in the same way that similar programs in like the United States have, have had. And it becomes sort of this bureaucratic process over time. Um, and I also wonder what it means for this sense of total work. You know, what, what, do, what do people do with their free time if they're, if they're afforded free time, but time is like this overwhelming process to them and they need to be useful and productive all the time and they can't be leisurable. They can't you know, deal with the leisure. Uh, I can't really say too much about labor certificates or public banking. Uh, the amorality of pushing degrowth on underdeveloped countries, you mentioned. Uh, 
I, I don't believe, well, degrowth principally is, f is for the developed world, right? We, small, poor countries are not the ones that are, that are causing the vast majority of the, of the climate crisis or the socio-ecological crises. Um, but that is not to say that they're not people within each country that are using materials and energy beyond their means and beyond the means of the planet. And that's true whether it's the US or France or, or Ethiopia, it doesn't matter. It's, it's a specific way of living and not a country itself that should be punished or held up in high esteem. It's, this is a very individual uh, process. Um, and along with that, so what you, you guys were asking what kind of economic system could we even call this. Uh, I don't think that we would necessarily call it capitalism. If what that I think, I think that if we had a really de a true degrowth society, we probably wouldn't use the name capitalism anymore. But I'm sure you guys are well aware that there are many varieties of all systems and that a name doesn't really define anything. Um, I think if we're going to go back to this sort of individual, uh, this understanding of how of individual right livelihood, then we can't really call it a system because it's just it's. I mean, and I, I I I was at the degrowth summer school this past uh, this past July, and I get the sense that while a lot of people that are interested in degrowth research and scholarship uh, use a Marxist standpoint and, and identify oftentimes as socialists. I feel like most people are anarchists actually uh, in, the, in the degrowth movement and so I don't know what you really call uh, or, or why you need to put a name on a system where people are freely working together in smaller community-based um, relationships. Uh, so we can, we can create different names for this post-capitalist society, but it doesn't really define necessarily what's, what's going on. Um, and I don't know what's feasible. I don't know whether it's feasible in a democratic system or if it's feasible within capitalism. I think these are fields of, of research. Actually, one of my colleagues at, uh, at Paris 13, my friend Antoine, he actually he started with he started with me. He's he's studying um, the possibilities for for degrowth from a post Keynesian standpoint, um, and it's really interesting work that he does. Yeah, I don't, let, let's uh, let's just open up the the floor to to questions actually. Okay. And uh, uh, are there questions? Let's collect um, two, three, a round of three questions. Um, I have a question first. You are speaking about many concepts that might be looks really beautiful, and it is really important to include. Oh, okay, my name. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Jinan Shiwek. I am from Option C. You are able to know. So um, my question is that you are speaking about beautiful concepts that is really we need to take into consideration the social aspects and it's really problematic, but how far it's really meeting the reality. This is I think the most important issue that we have to consider, especially you are living in a capitalist world and you have a lot of this crazy idea of productivity, diversification of the economy, inequality between different countries, between the people in, in specific countries. It's not easy really to, uh, like, to do it in the real world. And I think there are a lot of social aspects that we have to consider. Sometimes we say, okay, we don't want really society that cares much about producing as much as possible and they don't have a time for themselves. But there are many studies that shows that 
sometimes if you give more free time, it's also a problem. I'm not saying I'm, I'm not aware about what is the best solution, but I'm telling you that there are many dynamics within the society and within the world that we can't just speak about a beautiful concept. So my question is how far it's really meeting the reality. Um, my name is Luca from uh, Option A. And actually, I also, if you said you cannot um, say so much about it, I would like to come back to the idea of money, actually, and what role money plays in a possible transition. Right now, in the money system we have right now, through to the interest we have to pay through the, um, uh, the credit creation of money, um, actually, it creates the need for growth. It creates a need for... Um, uh, competition and for growth. Otherwise, we cannot pay back the interest. Mm -hmm. um, and my, I don't know if it's a question, it's maybe more like a, um, an, an idea like of the centrality actually of, because money is also one of the individual incentives for people, how to act, how to consume, um, how, what to work, in which sector to work. So I think actually when we think about that, it's really central to think about the impact of money. And maybe to make a comment on the question about time banking, how it's working right now as I see it, like an example where it works, it works mainly um, locally in communities um, where it however already works that you can, I know you work for the city for half an hour, you clean the park and for that you can then um, pay your, uh, the sh um, I know to cut your hair and actually it works on that small base but then there are not so many ideas yet to actually translate that and to upscale um, such systems um, on a bigger scale. Um, so I don't really have a question. Maybe <laughs> just like if you want to comment more on the on on, on the role on the role actually, because I have the feeling that actually money can has or can play a um, central role in the in the transition in a possible one. Maybe you can comment on that. Uh, okay. Your thoughts on that. Thanks again for thanks again for your presentation. Uh, like I was saying during the break, I think the goals and the sort of um, detailing of what is truly important and what is truly problematic at the moment in the world was right on point. Um, it, just to kind of elaborate on what we were talking about, I guess, is that to me it appears that you're completely right in saying there is this fixation on growth within economics, not only in the orthodoxy, um, but my slight sort of discomforts with degrowth is that there's almost a fixation on not growing, as in like trying to reduce growth. Um, and I think, to coin a Buddhist phrase, there is a middle way, right? <laughs> That's <laughs> growth itself, GDP itself. It's a useful indicator. It may in times um, be something we need to look at, but we neither need to maximize it nor minimize it as the a priori goal of human existence. Um, there are some types of growth that could be beneficial, could be useful, if it leads to um, types of automation that we are comfortable with, that allow us to be free in our daily lives and do what we find truly beautiful and meaningful. On top of that, it, equally, we can have forms of investments that allow us to, um, well, sustain a level of our current understanding of what is doable in terms of consumption and investments without destroying the planet, operating within our carbon budgets. And I think, and before we, you know, um, manage to convince the world to sort of, you know, look at what's truly important for themselves and work out what they actually need and want and so on, um, we can push for a sort of path towards, uh, you know, these these policies like UBI and work sharing and so on. But we we needn't scare off all the other economists and um, scientists even and and politicians by saying degrowth by saying, you know, let's go in the opposite direction. So I guess that's my, my comment and just whether or not you, you know, agree with this sentiment is what I would ask. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I will say to take this first round and as a suggestion I will say uh, since it seems there are a lot of questions and comments to keep a bit shorter in order to, uh, <laughs> to give the opportunity to everyone. All right, I'll, I'll go backwards actually. Um, right on point, I... I very much agree with you. I think the concept of degrowth is a, is a great concept. There's a good academic debate between ecological economists on 
what even just to call this system, whether degrowth is a good name, whether it should be called a growth, whether it's a system, whether it's a movement, whether we should be, yeah, a, a growth is like agnostic to growth, um, whether we should call it post growth, and I don't really care. <laughs> I don't, I, I really don't think the names of things are important. I, I only care about how people feel in the world and how we're relating to each other. And it seems unrealistic only because we are told our whole lives that we have to go to high school, to go to college, to go to, to get a job, to, and it's and I th I think we're I think we really believe really hard in the system. And I'm not saying that like you guys are all brainwashed and I'm the only one who's understood the system. I think I think everyone kind of glimpses this in a, in 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 different ways. Um, and and I I think that to I think that. To talk a bit about your question, um, I think that the way we're living our lives right now is equally unrealistic. We're just doing it, and it's unrealistic in the sense that it can't continue. And and we're we're destroying the planet and ourselves in the process. And that, to me, is the basis of unrealism. When I'm, when I'm here and I see you guys, I see a bunch of bright young people that are ready to, to help the world and that want to do something nice and that appreciate love and caring and, and the environment. And that, to me, is way more real than the need for competition and the need for overcome for the need for greed and the need for uh, stepping on each other to get to some high vaulted point that doesn't even exist because we just keep moving the marker higher and higher um, about the role of money I think I think you're you're definitely right. Obviously, money is going to play a role somehow. I actually, I think, I, if I'm not mistaken, Mark, you wrote a paper with with Louison about whether or not there was a debt, uh, a growth imperative in a capitalist economy. The conclusion was was no. I can't remember exactly why the. <laughs> if you if you want if you want to if you want to enlighten us to to the mechanism. Not to put you on the spot. <laughs> well, yes, uh, there is this literature in ecological economics saying that there is this growth imperative, as you said, you know, because people or firms need to borrow, then they have to pay interest, and therefore that leads to uh, that you need growth in order to pay interest, but. It's a false idea. I mean, it's uh, it's very simple to to write a stock flow consistent model where you reach a stationary state where there are interest payments, and therefore where there is no growth. So that's not the issue, uh, at least in my mind and that of uh, Louison, uh, who just finished his PhD thesis on ecological economics. Um. Not to not to put the spot on on you, Mark, but I was wondering if that's if because <laughs> I because I need to go back and read the paper again, <laughs> or I could just do that instead of asking you. Right, but you're right here right now. Um, whether it's possible or not is one question. Whether it's likely that is it whether it's likely to occur is another is another question. So given sort of the the various structures and 
and even our own personal beliefs, whether buying in to whether that whether the the growth imperative isn't isn't a isn't a, you know the 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 I, I apologize for not knowing how to how to ask this question whether the growth imperative is truly it, it's actually let's let's just uh let's just move on to the next question and I'll think about this harder <laughs> Maybe you know what I was trying to get to, that, that there is somehow not actually, um, I will skip it, <laughs> we'll skip it. Um, <clears throat> yeah, hi, I'm Carmen from Option B. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for your presentation. I really like when we touch upon the more fundamental questions. I think that's enriching. Uh, nevertheless, I, um, yeah, I have some questions slash critics. So one point would be, you have mentioned that uh, several ideas are not covered by economics. So I have not really understood uh, which economics you refer to. For example, in feminist economics, there's the broad notion of care. Mm -hmm. And you have a household sector and so on. So it's not true for, for um, this type of scholarship. And uh, many of your assumptions have been very normative by themselves. So for example, uh, the way you... Um, judge work and productivity versus uh, leisure, the way you tell, um, say, with a universal basic income, people wouldn't all of a sudden wouldn't know what to do with their uh, leisure time and uh, they would be overwhelmed because they love productivity. But what is wrong about loving productivity? Uh, I love, I, I mean, I love both my productivity as well as my free time and I, uh, I, I wouldn't want to get rid of this. And maybe last notion on the universal basic income, I think uh, it is uh, an interesting idea, nevertheless it pretends or it treats people the same that are inherently not the same. And I think this is true on two levels, first on the income level. You give the same amount of money to everyone, uh, regardless of the uh, income distribution which is currently prevailing in a society. And this is also true socially, because in most social contexts I have come about in my life, there are leaders and there are followers. And this is a very somehow normal thing that evolves. And you can foster this, you can suppress it, you can still um, give everyone equal rights, but nevertheless, it's also putting everyone uh, back to their own limits, and I think that's maybe not desirable. Victoria? Uh, my name is Victoria, I'm from Option B. Um, first, thank you very much for your presentation. I think it's really important that we finally get to talk about ecological economics here in this, in this group, because we haven't really, and it's one of the mo most important concepts I think uh, we should learn in this program. Um, I am absolutely for degrowth, but I disagree with you that it's not important what we call things. I think it's very important what we call things, beca because we have to sell this idea, right? If we want to take concrete steps towards degrowth, or towards whatever you want to call it, right? We have to find a name and we have to find a concept that we can sell to a lot of people. Um, and I'm not quite sure whether the way you presented it might be that way. Like, um, I, like I really agree with the concept, right? But talking about it in terms of um, we all want to be happy because we do this, right? Kind of imposing people are happy when they do this and this mm -hmm. and that. I'm not quite sure if that's the way to sell this to the majority of the population, but that's a different discussion, I think. Okay. Um, what I want to talk about is that we, we've talked about how uh, unrealistic all of this might be, right? About the likelihood of any of this happening, yeah. but we haven't really talked about concrete steps yet, right? And one of these concrete steps um, that, or one of the things that might be a concrete step towards degrowth um, is satellite accounts to GDP. Right, measuring the resources we use, measure, measuring the kind of resources um, that are being abused. Um, and we've only just started doing this, right? There are, there are satellite accounts in like this in Canada, there are some in, in many European states. But it's not a thing that states, states have to do. So they're not, they're not even aware of the resources mm -hmm. they lose and the way they lose them, which also means that as of now, we would be unable to take steps like, as you guys have discussed in your presentation, like taxation 
of all, all kinds of um, abuse mm -hmm. of, the, uh, of the natural resources we have. So this is one concrete step that I was kind of missing in, in, in the presentation that I think uh, deserves to be mentioned. Um, and uh, so my question to you is kind of um, how, like, how do you think we can promote this idea of like the satellite accounts? How, how do we get this to, to go quicker? Because we have to have a way to measure things to be able to, uh, uh, to really find solutions to the whole degrowth problem that we have. Yeah. Thank you. Come to you. So, first, sorry, Casper, that asked me for even before, but I don't like fitness. That's why. Okay. Hi, I'm Casper, uh, option B. Um, I have a comment and a question. Um, first, a comment. You talked about green investment and uh, how you don't really believe in it. I feel like you're mixing up some concepts um, because you talked about how um, green investment is related to increased efficiency and how this efficiency would only lead to more production and therefore not help us towards mitigated climate change at all. I don't really see how you're not really defining your idea of efficiency, so it's not clear to me what kind of efficiency mm. you're talking about, because when I think about green investment, I think about carbon efficiency. So it's not so much about more investment, but about replacement of investment. Mm -hmm. So I don't see how investment with lower uh, carbon emissions would be bad. Um, so that was my, that's a comment. And my question um, is, I'm a bit wondering whether your critique on economics when it comes to uh, the view of how we view work and wealth and whether, whether growth and, and more work is really a good thing, whether it's really a critique on economics or on society and our culture. I mean, is this idea really coming from economic science or is it really embedded in our culture? And related to that, I think your story was a bit US centric because this whole thing about work it's a very American thing I think in most other continents people have a very different uh, different view so um, the question then is is the way we do economics is heterodox economics really incompatible with a different view uh, towards wealth and towards work or Uh, we can take a third round, then and you can ask. Uh, you can answer now if you. Let's stop here now with the question, and then we take another round of questions. Okay. Um, great questions, guys. Awesome. <laughs> uh, I'll start. I'll I'll try and go backwards again. Actually, uh, in terms of efficiency. And creating growth and, and replacing investment. If you are investing in new in new technologies, it doesn't matter what technology you're investing in. You're generally hiring more workers. You're increasing pro you're increasing production of whatever plants to to create these new these new capital materials, and you're increasing the resources that go into creating these new, this new efficient capital. And what you're doing when you're doing that is you're also creating more income for workers who can then spend that money and it, and it goes throughout the system. At the same time that you're doing that, the company that now uses this new capital can throw out their old capital, sure, they, and, they, and now, now they're using more efficient, they're more using more efficient capital. But there are several, they're, they're now able to produce the same amount more cheaply and therefore potentially use that extra income to buy more things or invest in other things, which increases more growth. So this, this, is, this is the whole Jevons, this is the Jevons paradox itself is, is that as you're increasing the efficiency of the system, you're also increasing, increasing the capacity for, for growth. It's not necessarily about, sorry, 
it's not necessarily about efficiency. It's, a, it's just about having less emissions. That doesn't necessarily create more production. If you, if you use green energy instead mm -hmm. of fossil fuel energy, that doesn't lead to more production or more consumption or more profits or whatso whatsoever. Correct. Re you're, you're definitely right that reducing... Th there's, there's, there's definitely relative decoupling. But whether absolute decoupling of energy and resources is, is able to be accomplished at the scale that's necessary is what I'm questioning. And so certainly there's, certainly you can create the, the uh, you can reduce the, the amount of materials and energy, and energy in, that you're using and, and increase the efficiency of the system through uh, in investments in green technology. I'm not debating that at all. But um, my, my assumption is that in order to meet the targets that we've defined for ourselves, which is two degrees Celsius warming above free industrial levels by 2050, I, I don't think that we're going to be able to do it in the, in the time that's necessary by just, by just investing in green, green energy sources. Maybe we can talk about this I mean, afterwards. There's, there's obviously, obviously a lot necessary to reach those targets, but... Um not investing in green energy. Well, I'm, so, I'm, I'm sorry. I don't, I, obviously, I, obviously, I believe I believe that that's that's a better that's a better process than 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 not doing anything. I think that I think that the scale which is going to be done in the current in as it's as we're moving right now is not going to happen. And I obviously I think that you know we should take the entire war budget and put it towards green energy. That's uh, that I, I'm completely. In, in accordance with you on, on that, but, but I'm, not, I'm not seeing that happening anytime soon. Um, and, I, and I don't want to count on some magic market mechanism for, mm. for this to happen. Well, and, I don't, and I certainly don't count on Donald Trump <laughs> to invest in, in solar technology anytime soon either. But you, don't you think it's still more likely that we move towards greener options than... Yeah, yeah, I, th I, I, definitely, I definitely think so. I definitely do. Uh, and whether or not heterodox economics is truly compatible with, uh, with ecological issues and, and some of the things that I'm, that I'm talking about. I mean, obviously, I came up here to, to draw up a straw man and, and just kind of make you, guys, make you guys think about what kinds of economics we're doing, what some of the, what are some of the assumptions that we have, and I obviously cannot characterize every, every way of doing economics because everyone's doing economics their own way and everyone conceives of the economy in their own, in their own way. Um, and f obviously feminist economics is doing very important work on care work. I do think though that what we traditionally recognize as economics, especially in the political realm, in the, you know, our, our so-called leaders, what they judge as economics is a very specific form of doing economics. And it's fair to say that in most colloquiums, for example, I was at the post-Keynesian uh, conference in, in Grenoble recently, and there was very little about feminist, I don't think there was a single presentation on feminist economics. I was one of two or three or four presentations on, on ecological economics out of 200 or I don't know. And there was, a, there was actually, Mark, you can, you can attest to this too, uh, we, were, we had a a discussion on the future of post-Keynesian economics that you were actually in the, on the panel for. And the entire time, the panelists were, th and, the, and the questions were about how post-Keynesian economics is just losing to neoclassical economics, and this is, and, and it seems to be our fate, and what's, go and what's gonna happen, and we didn't, there was, there was no holding up high 
what we really want to protect and what we think are great issues that we can, we can help with going forward. And I, that really made me, that, that honestly it was kind of depressing and it's, it's probably the fifth panel that I've seen, it's the tenth one that you've been on, I'm sure, about the future of, po of post-Keynesian economics and, and it seemed like we had given up. And that might be a, a false, that might be like my own bias and my own criticism, but it, it really felt like that to me. And, uh, and I don't think that that's what a lot of really smart economists that are, that are really interested in social issues and really interested in, in creating a better world, that's, that's not the kind of, that's not what they want to feel like publishing and talking about. Is just false about, false it was a false impression. <laughs> Then it, then it was, then that was all me. <laughs> okay, other questions? Um, thank you very much. My name is Akonde Emanuel. I'm from Option A. I just want to ask uh, this very simple question of mine that's been running in my mind. I said I just want to ask this uh, simple question in my mind. Is the concept of the growth opposite to the growth concept, the, uh, the growth mechanism, are they mutually ex uh, exclusive? Then uh, the, number, the, the second question is that when we have more time to, f uh, to consume, or maybe to, uh, for leisure activities, it means another pattern of consumption. So we tend to consume more of the cultural goods. So the uh, cultural industry would, uh, would develop uh, do the school of thought of the growth consider this? What is the future of the increasing or the enhanced consumption of industrial goods? Then I want uh, the third question. Sorry, uh, I wanted to comment on China uh, approach to uh, building uh, plantation houses. They are building houses with grains, uh, with grains plants, and they are investing heavily on solar panel. Mm -hmm. What does this mean for uh, the group? Uh, hi, I'm Yelena from Option A. And uh, I also, I first have a, just a comment. I really want to thank you for the, um, uh, in generally, more global view on some topic. Although my colleague criticized uh, your view that you didn't focus on one that you gave us more globally. View, I think, where uh, we have seen a lot of lectures here who focused on just one segment of it. But I think we really need to look at some things at some point more globally, how it's all interconnected. So thank you. Uh, what I wanted to comment is, um, uh, in one way, I remember when, you, when we were talking about uh, glo uh, green investment, I've read recently on, um, in some journal uh, that um, we've been investing, for instance, in, um, green, in um, uh, paper cups, in a bars, thinking that it's, it's going to be like better for uh, less use of plastic, so it's more green. But then uh, we actually don't even know that they are not being recycled. And in this way, we are using so much of the other resources. So I think I understood uh, your way also that sometimes it's not easily connected, but we do. In order to get more green one stuff, we do use other resources because we're using a lot of trees to, to get this and we're not even recycling it. So that was just um, another comment that I read. And what I want to ask you is that um, you were mentioning the little Nathaniel, which was really interesting to, <laughs> to see. And I think all of us know some, somewhere deep about this problem and the system creating it. And we have seen your views on what is wrong and what shouldn't be done. But I want to know, what do you think, how are we supposed to promote uh, these ideas? Because all of us want to go to the nature, and I'm sure it's easy to convince kids, but how in this system? And that's it. Thank you. Yeah. Well, f uh, my name is Julian from Option B. I'm from Argentina. Uh, first, thank you very much for coming. This was really fresh air. I really enjoyed it. Um, but I have two questions. One, actually, guys, is for you that presented. I want to ask something on your little nice trilemma degrowth. And the other one is for you. At the beginning of your presentation, I was really angry <laughs> because I felt myself represented in that cartoon that you, sh you showed. So I felt myself now to be 
I'm pushed to ask you those questions. How you are like <laughs> decriticizing? How, how are we going to get there? You are judging other people's life with this thing about yeah. this obsession of growth. I share Carmen's point, and so on and so forth. But now I'm moving to a more constructive part because people have more or less done those questions, which is um, and regarding that you were at this uh, at this Grenoble conference and you lost kind of. Like where are we going? What do you think is the role that we should have as Epoch student economists? How we should face this issue? What should be our role? Where we move forward? And for you guys, um, and it seems that people always do with these trilemma things. Uh, what about if it's not a trilemma but a dilemma? And I don't really think that here is the trilemma of growth and um, any mode of production, it seems to me. I don't know if it's specific to capitalism because we need mass production because we are 7,000 million, is that the way to say it in English? 7,000 <laughs> million? Uh, people, yeah, 7 billion. 7 billion people, and we just need to feed everybody. And I don't know if it's really about socialism, state capitalism, planned economy. You are kind of assuming that a planned economy will solve these issues, and mm -hmm. I don't know if we can do that given this 450 points per carbon target that we have. No, but I don't fully get your point. Your point is that there is a dilemma between yes, capitalism and socialism in this sense. Uh, <laughs> 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 if you want to simplify it. Huh? Yeah, I mean, I also I, I agree because uh, my the, the the issue when I when we discussed the trilemma was that we don't know if state capitalism or plan. Uh, planned economy is really sustainable. For sure, it's not sustainable in the long run. So, in the end, the trilemma is reduced to a dilemma between capitalism and, s and the post capitalist transition. I don't know if we want to call socialism, but I will say that if we are in a capitalist society, uh, it's, it's, it's diffi very difficult, almost impossible to, to push the sustainability. Um. Where do we go from here? <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's a lot of pressure on me, guys. <laughs> um, I, I really appreciate this conversation. I really appreciate all your questions. Um, I think I, it's, it's funny because I, I put so much so much effort on this like systemic systemic problem and the ways we're, we're conceiving of these of these huge systems and how are we going to change this whole big thing and i really deep down i feel that this is ultimately a personal a personal shift and i i don't know if i put any faith in I mean, uh, certainly there's a role for, for writing your senators and writing your congressmen and, <laughs> and, and, and all of that. But I think that ultimately this is a, this is a spiritual path and, a, and, a, and a, personal, a personal path for everyone. Because one day you will be in a boardroom, like Nathan, like Nathaniel, <laughs> Um, and he may be your boss. And the question will come up, well, we need this resource and we need it cheaply because we need to sell. And then what's our, what's, what's our plan here? And the option, the easy option might not be the prudent option. And the one that's most profitable to the company might not be the one that you know in your heart is what is right to do. And I think that if you allow yourself to feel that and to, f and to stand for what you believe in, then, then we don't have to worry about what policies are put in place and and who's, who's running the country and what system we're calling it, because then it's just a bunch of people 
acting out of what they, what they know is true. And, and I can't really say anything other than that, because if I can act in communion with, with the world and everyone else around me, then, then I'm actively creating a society that reflects the values that I believe in. And that's all I have to say about that.